started doing a PhD with Chris Willett at UNC, and then I continue on doing my postdoc with Ron Burton at Scripps in San Diego. So I am uh, generally interested in uh, understanding the genetic basis of hybrids, sterility, and hybrid viability. So these hybrid problems evolve when an ancestral population uh, gets separated, and then um, gene flow stops, or it decreases a lot, so that the two populations diverge. And as long as their genome diverge to a certain amount, if they ever come back together, or you bring them together in a lab, and they mate, um, the hybrid can have problems, um, they can be sterile or have lower fertility or fecundity, or they can be inviolable. Uh, the causes for these hybrid problems um, are usually uh, because of the evolution of the chance commular incompatibilities. So these are incompatibilities between two or more uh, loci. So in the ancestral population, you have the little a, little b alleles, and then as they uh, separate, you get a big A allele here, and it works well with any of the ancestral alleles. In the other population, you get a big B allele, and it also works well with the ancestral um, alleles. And then they go to fixation, or close to fixation, in each of the populations, and then when these populations hybridize, now we have these uh, derived alleles that have never been tested together in the same genomic background, and they may not work together. A lot of times these incompatibilities are recessive or partially recessive, so you won't necessarily see them in the F1 hybrids, but you do when you do either back crosses or in the F2 hybrids when you get double homozygous. Um, and this model here is for nuclear-nuclear uh, interactions, but this can also happen uh, between mitonuclear genes, so now we're going from top to bottom. Um, so you have the ancestral population, and then as they separate, uh, the mitochondria may diverge, and then the nuclear genes that interact with the mitochondria have to co-adapt, and then the same thing can happen uh, between nuclear and mitochondrial genes. So these are what we call mitonuclear incompatibilities, while the ones before is what we would call nuclear-nuclear incompatibilities. So I uh, am studying these questions in the Copepod tigreopus californicus. So they live in splash pools, really high up on the intertidal zone, um, all the way across uh, from Baja, Mexico to Alaska. Uh, the populations are very segregated, and the mitochondrial DNA is crazy divergent. So here we have two populations in San Diego. They're about eight kilometers apart and the mitochondrial DNA is almost 10% different. And then from San Diego to close to LA, the mitochondrial DNA is almost 20% different, so pretty crazy. And then when we cross these guys, so here I'm showing just one measurement of fitness. This is almost the same for a bunch of different other measurements. Um, so we have, you know, the parents have a certain level of fitness. When we cross them, the F1 hybrids tend to have higher fitness, so we see heterosis, okay? And then when you cross F1 hybrids, then F2 and F3 hybrids have lower fitness. This is called hybrid breakdown. And then if you back cross these F2 hybrids, either to the paternal uh, uh, population or the maternal one, in one direction you rescue some of that fitness back, and this is because you're back crossing to uh, a mother, so you get the mitochondria and increase the, the nuclear uh, allele frequency towards the, that population as well and recover some of that fitness. So this suggests that some of this problem is because of mitonuclear incompatibilities, but it doesn't really say how much nuclear-nuclear incompatibilities we have in there as well. So the goals of uh, my project was to look for uh, regions of the genome they're involved in hybrid variability, and then to determine how much of that is because of nuclear nuclear versus mitonuclear incompatibilities. And the way we do this, here I'm showing just two example populations. So ABs around LA, SD San Diego, we cross them, get F1 hybrids, cross them, get the F2 hybrids, and then we pull about 300 or 400 individuals and we sequence. So this is using pool seat, just like uh, it was done in the talk before. 
Uh, so because these are pool organisms, we can look at allele frequency, but not at genotypes. So then our expectation is that the allele frequency in the F2 hybrid should be around 0.5 if there was no selection. And then if there is selection against certain gene combinations, then you would shift allele frequency away from that 0.5. And notice that because we're looking at F2 hybrids, we don't expect a lot of recombination. So I'm not really looking to find genes here. I'm looking at genome-wide patterns um, and comparing different crosses to see how um, these patterns are similar or not. So first we wanted to make sure that we could actually detect these shifts in allele frequency because it's F2 hybrid. Uh, there may not be a lot of allele frequency change at that point. So we sequence for this one cross, the babies, um, right before they hatched. And we did this because before we had seen that there's usually no uh, skew in genotypes. Um, so then if this was true, we would expect all the allele frequency to be around the 0.5 line. And here uh, we have the 12 chromosomes in the copepod, and I'm always gonna be showing the allele frequency towards the AB population because it's in all of the crosses. So you see that when they're born, there is no shifts in allele frequency, but then when they're adults, you have shifts in different chromosomes. So these both show that the shift is because of hybrid inviability and not meiotic drive or something else. And also that we can uh, observe these shifts in allele frequency. So I compared three different crosses. All the crosses involved this AB population, and they were crossed to San Diego, Catalina Island and Santa Cruz. This is the phylogeny for them, but if we look at genome-wide uh, synonymous substitution rate, you see that there is very little increase in, in how divergent these crosses are. So they have very similar levels of divergence. And then I perform the reciprocal crosses. So the nuclear genomes should be the same in the hybrids, but in each direction of the cross, you get a different mitochondria, right? So uh, the blue, uh, the black dots all indicate the direction where we have the AB mitochondrial DNA. The blue dots will indicate the other uh, population mitochondrial DNA. And then uh, nuclear nuclear incompatibilities, the two direction of the cross should show shifts in allele frequency that overlap, right? Because the nuclear genome should be the same. Mitonuclear incompatibilities, you should have higher nuclear allele frequency towards the population that matches the mitochondria. So then the black dots should have higher uh, AB allele frequency than the blue dots. So it could be this way, it could be this way, or it could just be shifted in both directions, right? It is also possible that you have mismatch. So you select nuclear alleles for one population in the mitochondrial background of the other population. And each one of these dots on my plots is the average of 3,000 SNPs. We did this to decrease noise, and we don't really expect recombination, so we're looking at more genome-wide patterns, or chromosome-wide patterns. All right, so here are the three crosses, the San Diego, Catalina Island, and Santa Cruz, the 12 chromosome, A, B, allele frequency, Here's the 0.5 line, and then these red lines uh, is kind of our threshold for what we consider a significant shift in allele frequency. So um, if we look for evidence for nuclear-nuclear incompatibilities, there are three cases, and two of them are in this ABSD cross, and this one here is uh, a pretty strong one. And then we have a couple of other uh, cases only on this cross where the shift is not really strong, but it is consistent across the whole chromosome. And for now, uh, ignore these quick changes in allele frequency. This is because of misassembled scaffold, so it's not a real signal. Okay? We don't expect something that uh, sharp. Okay, so what's the evidence for mitonuclear incompatibility? So this is when the black dots are higher. Um, so you see that we have uh, a lot more chromosomes now involved across the crosses. Um, and again, this top cross has more chromosomes than the other one, but now this cross that showed no nuclear-nuclear incompatibilities now is showing evidence for minor nuclear ones. 
And then again, there's some uh, lower effect one, so they don't deviate too much from the 0.5 line, but when you compare the two directions, they do have um, some level of deviation. And then do we see evidence for these mismatch in compatibilities? And there's actually, surprisingly, quite a bit of that. So this, uh, to me, is interesting because you're selecting nuclear alleles from one population when you have the mitochondria for the other one. But it makes sense in, in these organisms because genetic drift is really strong for these guys. Um, we know they uh, fix some slightly deleterious um, Mutations, that's probably why when we do the F1 hybrids, we see that they have higher fitness. So this may be part of that reason. Um, the nuclear alleles for the other population just work better. And then we have some uh, lower back ones here too. Okay, so what have I shown you? So we do see uh, all kinds of incompatibilities. Um, and I think the first thing that is interesting to me is that when you compare all of the crosses, um, they don't share a lot of similarities. So the patterns of which chromosomes um, show these skews is very different, independent of what kind of uh, incompatibility that you're looking at. Um, also, we do see some uh, strong nuclear-nuclear incompatibilities, but it's mostly in one cross. And in fact, that one cross, which is the least divergent of all of them, even though it's not by a lot, that's the cross that shows uh, the most uh, incompatibilities. And then in, in average, it seems that mitonuclear incompatibilities are uh, more important than, than the other types of incompatibilities in this case. So I want to thank uh, everyone in Ron's lab and then all the undergraduates that helped me when I was at UNC, and I can take questions now. Thank you. Yeah. What sort of coverage do you have for the pool tube? Um, yeah, so I try to get around 80x coverage. Um, 